Topic for next uh, session is timing of uh, cholecystectomy in acute pancreatitis. To chair this session, I would like to call upon uh, Dr. Rajesh Gupta sir from Chandigarh, professor and head of the department of uh, PJMR Chandigarh. Uh, other chairperson we have uh, Dr. Rupesh Pokhana sir. He is a senior professor in department of gastroenterology, SMS Medical College, Jaipur. Welcome, sir. I think Rajesh, please carry on. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity, Professor Kapoor. It's my privilege to introduce uh, Professor Nicholas Ziromsky, who is uh, the professor of the surgery at Indiana University. He has a lot of experience in pancreatitis, and I think uh, uh, he is going to tell us about the timing of surgery in acute pancreatitis. May I request Professor, professor Ziromsky to start his talk, please? Uh uh, Dr. Ziromsky, you want us to play the video or you would prefer to make a live uh, presentation? I think it would be best for the international internet connection if you play the video. Thank yes, you, Professor Kapoor. That would be better. Please play the video. Good afternoon. Many thanks to Professor Kapoor and congratulations on assembling an outstanding global faculty for the first Jaipur Surgical Festival. I'm pleased to be able to join you virtually and look forward to future events and visiting the beautiful pink city in person. My task today is to discuss the timing of cholecystectomy in acute pancreatitis. I bring greetings from Indiana University in the central United States. This is the state of Indiana. We have a major pancreas referral center performing nearly 400 pancreatectomies annually. We're supported by a very busy ERCP team and have an extensive experience with pancreatitis. I'd like to speak today about the data supporting the concept of early cholecystectomy in the setting of mild biliary pancreatitis, proceed to discuss the very different clinical situation of necrotizing pancreatitis, and finally, follow up with some data addressing the question of whether endoscopic biliary sphincterotomy is able to provide quote unquote definitive therapy for patients who may be considered too frail for surgery. Nicolaus Tulp in 1652 provided the first clear description of acute pancreatitis. This is a painting of Tulp, the Dutch anatomist rendered by Rembrandt. In 1901, Eugene Opie, the Hopkins pathologist, implicated gallstones in acute pancreatitis pathogenesis and described the first episode of acute pancreatitis. Acute pancreatitis, as we all know, is a very common problem. This accounts for nearly 300,000 hospitalizations annually in the United States alone. At least half of new acute pancreatitis episodes are caused by biliary etiology. For years, surgical dogma has dictated that the patient admitted with biliary pancreatitis should have cholecystectomy before the patient is discharged from the hospital. The rationale for this teaching is to prevent recurrent acute pancreatitis. Important questions are how frequently does recurrent acute pancreatitis happen and when does this occur? In a practice dealing with a su substantial number of necrotizing pancreatitis patients, I've observed that nearly every patient with severe acute pancreatitis has had an antecedent episode. It's almost like the mild acute pancreatitis has primed the pancreas for the severe insult. Therefore, in my opinion, cholecystectomy to prevent recurrent acute pancreatitis is indeed a critically important practice. 
These are selections from three major English language textbooks of surgery highlighting recommendations for same admission colon cystectomy. Let's evaluate the data from which these recommendations arise. Between OP's description in 1901 and the early part of the 20th century, not much was recorded regarding biliary acute pancreatitis. In the 1950s, John Howard and Ehrlich, as well as Raker and Bartlett, reported the concept of relapsing pancreatitis. Here are a series of retrospective papers published between 1960 and 1990, documenting over 30% incidence of recurrent acute pancreatitis in patients who did not have early cholecystectomy. Importantly, these studies document recurrent acute pancreatitis happening within six to 12 weeks after the index insult. These are the data providing foundation for our contemporary recommendation of same admission cholecystectomy to treat biliary pancreatitis. Let's digress into science. Yes, the science of straining stool. Eric Milborn, a Swede, reported from Lund in 1941, patients with stones recuperated from their stool coinciding with an, an incidence of acute pancreatitis. This observation was validated by Acosta and his colleagues in the early 1970s. These investigators studied patients with acute pancreatitis and known gallstones. Straining the stool of these patients recovered gallstones in nearly all. Not a particularly tasteful endeavor, but critically important to the science nonetheless. Fast forward to the 21st century and level one evidence regarding timing of cholecystectomy in mild biliary pancreatitis. This study is reported by the Dutch Pancreatitis Group, leaders in the world in surgical prospective randomized trials. Their PONCHO trial randomized patients to receive cholecystectomy at the same admission from pancreatitis versus interval cholecystectomy within 25 to 30 days. These authors, not surprisingly, found a substantially increased risk in their hands 9% of recurrent pancreatitis in the interval cholecystectomy group. Therefore, we now have level one evidence to support the concept of early cholecystectomy in the setting of biliary pancreatitis. But how early is too early? We also have level one evidence to address this question. Both of these papers were published in the Annals of Surgery. Both relatively small studies randomized mild biliary pancreatitis patients to cholecystectomy performed either early, less than 48 hours or less than 24 hours, to cholecystectomy performed after the patient's symptoms had resolved. Both of these studies demonstrated that early cholecystectomy was safe. The caveat is that one should wait at least 12 hours before operating to ensure that the patient will not be progressing to severe acute pancreatitis. Therefore, the dogma of waiting until a patient's symptoms have resolved before performing cholecystectomy are now challenged. Both of these studies conclude that larger trials are necessary to validate these preliminary observations. So the take home message from mild biliary pancreatitis is that nearly one third of untreated patients will have recurrent acute pancreatitis. Most of these recurrent episodes will happen between six to 12 weeks from the index insult. Again, my anecdotal experience is that recurrent acute pancreatitis is often more severe highlighting the importance of index cholecystectomy. Same admission cholecystectomy is ideal. If logistical challenges exist and a patient is reliable, performing cholecystectomy at an early interval may be necessary. Let's digress again to consider some clinical evidence for the common channel therapy theory of biliary pancreatitis. Several investigators, including Bill Traverso in 1994, documented clear reflux into the pancreatic duct at the time of intraoperative cholangiography for cholecystectomy in biliary pancreatitis patients. In addition, a number of basic science labs have made observations that it is very challenging to give animals pancreatitis simply by ligating their pancreatic duct. In fact, it's often necessary to inject bile salts such as toracolate into the pancreatic duct to initiate acute pancreatitis in animal models. One animal that is an exception to this rule is the American opossum, studied by Michael Steer, Frank Moody, and Howard Reber. 
this animal has a long common channel innately. And in fact, ligating the American opossum common channel gives these animals terrible necrotizing pancreatitis. This is a good segue into necrotizing pancreatitis. This disease obviously is dramatically different than mild acute pancreatitis. Necrotizing pancreatitis affects about 15% of patients with acute pancreatitis and has a mortality rate, even in this day, of about 20%. The natural course of necrotizing pancreatitis lasts anywhere from six months to longer, as represented by this timeline. Traditionally, the teaching based on data dating back to John Ranson's group in the 1970s was that early surgical intervention actually increased morbidity in severe acute pancreatitis, particularly related to infection. And the recommendation was to wait until the severe pancreatitis episode had resolved before performing cholecystectomy. Bill Nilon presented data validating this concept in the early part of the 21st century. This study published in the Annals of Surgery documented substantially higher sepsis in necrotizing pancreatitis patients with peripancreatic collections who underwent early cholecystectomy. These authors' recommendation was to delay cholecystectomy until it became clear whether any intervention would be required to treat the pancreatic collection. In 2010, however, the Panter study from the Dutch pancreatitis group stimulated a sea change in the management of necrotizing pancreatitis. Historically, surgical management was the go-to strategy to take care of necrosis. Sometimes this required multiple debridements, but cholecystectomy could be performed at the time of operative debridement. The Panther trial introduced the concept of the step-up approach and select necrotizing pancreatitis patients, starting with medical therapy, including antibiotics, progressing to percutaneous drainage, which will definitively treat at least a third of patients, if percutaneous drainage doesn't work, progressing to transgastric or minimally invasive debridement, and finally relegating transabdominal surgical approach as the final step for those who have failed more minimally invasive approaches. The question is, what do you do with the gallbladder during this time period for patients being treated by this minimally invasive approach? Our group combined our experience with that of the Massachusetts General Hospital to evaluate a contemporary series of 31 patients undergoing minimally invasive step-up treatment. Both our group and the MGH group have embraced a strategy of waiting to perform cholecystectomy until definitive therapy of pancreas neglections was complete. Interestingly, we found a 22.5% incidence of gallstone-related complications during the time minimally invasive step-up treatment was carried out, suggesting we should perhaps rethink our approach to the gallbladder in this group of necrotizing pancreatitis patients. More excellent data became available just this year from the Dutch pancreatitis group. This large series of 248 patients with necrotizing pancreatitis from biliary etiology was studied to determine the optimal timing of cholecystectomy. 2% of patients with residual necrosis developed infected necrosis after cholecystectomy. Most importantly, perhaps, 27% of patients developed significant biliary events before cholecystectomy was performed. These events happened at a significantly lower rate before 10 weeks of time. So perhaps 10 weeks is a reasonable time to perform cholecystectomy in the necrotizing pancreatitis patient. Obviously, treatment approaches must be tailored to the individual patient situation. A sub-analysis was undertaken to determine whether endoscopic sphincterotomy provided benefit in reducing biliary complications. And interestingly, in the setting of necrotizing pancreatitis patients, endoscopic sphincterotomy did not seem to decrease the incidence of biliary events. This leads to the final data slide from this talk, a Cochrane review of a clinical situation that occurs from time to time with patients who are simply felt to be too frail for general anesthetic or cholecystectomy. In this group of patients, in mild acute pancreatitis, endoscopic sphincterotomy does appear to provide significant decrease in the incidence of recurrent acute pancreatitis to less than 1%. It is notable, however, that these patients experience nearly 16% chance a biliary colic or cholecystitis. So what can we conclude? Number one, patients with mild biliary pancreatitis should have cholecystectomy 
during the same hospital admission if possible and practical. Early cholecystectomy does not appear to increase the risk of adverse events. In patients with necrotizing pancreatitis, it's okay to delay cholecystectomy, although perhaps not beyond 10 weeks. Finally, in the setting of mild biliary pancreatitis, endoscopic sphincterotomy decreases the risk of recurrent biliary pancreatitis substantially to approximately 1%. I put the final bullet point to remind all surgeons, please image the bile duct in patients with acute pancreatitis, either by intraoperative cholangiogram, magnetic resonance cholangiography, or endoscopic cholangiography. Thank you all again for the privilege of the podium Congratulations again on an outstanding Congress, and please visit us in Indianapolis when you get to the United States. I hope we have some time for questions and discussion. Yeah, Rajesh, please. Yeah, thank you, Mike. So Mike, I think uh, it's a comprehensive uh, coverage of the, the whole spectrum of pancreatitis, biliary pancreatitis. Obviously, the the I think the guidelines are clear, especially after the Poncho trial. But the problem here is with uh, necrotizing pancreatitis, and uh, I mean uh, the concept that doing or trying to do early necrosectomy can introduce infection in sterile fluid collections, and uh, obviously delaying it beyond a certain extent, like ten weeks, this runs the risk of increasing the uh, runs the risk of recurrences. So I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, it is vital for us to understand and look at the clinical course in necrotizing pancreatitis and also to emphasize to the patient that laparoscopic, uh, necro laparoscopic cholecystectomy may not be a viable option in severe necrotizing pancreatitis. And these patients, we may not be able to achieve critical view of safety because of the inflammation and the uh, inflammation in the retroperitoneum, which can actually obscure the critical view of safety. So open cholecystectomy would remain a viable option in uh, severe necrotizing pancreatitis. And obviously you have emphasized a very important point of imaging the bile duct whenever we are planning surgery in these patients of biliary pancreatitis. I, I, would, uh, I, I will look forward to your comments and then I open this for the house. Well, Rajesh, I think that you have um, hit these points right on, the, right on the head. The interesting idea is the tension between recurrent acute pancreatitis or recurrent biliary symptoms and the potential problem of infecting uh, sterile fluid collection. The, um, and, and again, I think really the most important point is that all of these complex necrotizing pancreatitis patients are managed with a multidisciplinary team with consistent input. This is a long-term disease process, but the patients must be addressed and evaluated frequently and then look at the individual patient. It's not impossible to do laparoscopic cholecystectomy in necrotizing pancreatitis, but a uh, uh, approach to um, safe open cholecystectomy or subtotal cholecystectomy is is a safe operation as well. And again, consider the patient's safety overall in the setting of a really complicated clinical situation. I agree completely, Dr. Kapoor, please. Yeah. Can I can I ask? Uh... So the dilemma uh, on a few occasions that I have faced is a young patient who has had an attack of acute pancreatitis and a peripancreatic fluid collection, uh, which did not require any intervention. And on follow-up, it is decreasing in size, but it's still there. So what do I do? Do I do the cholecystectomy hoping that this will resolve because it is resolving? Or do I wait for it to completely resolve and then do the cholecystectomy? Well, I think, uh, thanks for the question and the comment, and obviously um, comes from experience. Um, I, I think the question about peripancreatic fluid collections and resolution is interesting because some of them resolve men, and, and many of them don't. And as long as the patient doesn't have major symptoms from the fluid collection, such as gastric outlet obstruction 
or nausea or early satiety, I think moving ahead and treating the patient like the disease is quote unquote resolved is fair. Um, I think that the interesting information from this, I would highly commend the Dutch paper from gut from this year to everybody, because this is level one evidence. This is really great evidence that's um, looking at symptoms from the, from the cholecystectomy, from cholecystitis, recurrent cholangitis, cholecystitis, and it looks like 10 weeks is a fair time point to kind of put the barometer. So if somebody's getting better from acute pancreatitis, they still have an acute fluid collection, then probably around the time of eight, nine weeks would be some time to consider cholecystectomy as long, again, as they're asymptomatic. I follow all of these people with non-resolving fluid collections longitudinally because I'm interested in the problem. And I've seen a few people who develop symptoms in the long term. The one thing that I would caution um, about is a large retro, central retroperitoneal collection that can inflame the splenic artery and lead to splenic artery pseudoaneurysm, which could be a potentially fatal problem in the long term. But again, very challenging clinical situation. Great question. Uh, Dr. Sanjay Nagaral wants to make a comment. Yeah, before that, Rajesh, you wanted to say something? No, no, just a corollary to what you said, uh, what Professor Kapoor said. You know, Nick, if in a patient who, who otherwise is improving, like uh, Professor Kapoor was alluding to, and there is a residual collection, do you think if we have waited beyond six weeks and we have allowed this stage of a one or a pseudocyst to form, that means a wall has been formed, would the risk of infection in such a localized collection would be less compared to acute peripancreatic fluid or perinecrotic collection? I, th that's a great question. I don't know the answer. The data from Bill Nilan's series suggests that the incidence of, of infecting the peripancreatic collection, many of which were walled off necrosis, that the infection is substantial. So maybe a, a middle ground would be doing a cholecystectomy, but perhaps prescribing three or four days of antibiotics in the perioperative period, as opposed to the typical one dose of antibiotics in the operating room. Thank you. Dr. Sanjay, please. Sanjay? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes. yes. So uh, my, my question is sort of in the same uh, line that is being discussed. So we can understand that uh, in the waiting period, uh, you could get another biliary problem due to the stones that have not been tackled. But is there anything like a sort of fresh attack of pancreatitis superimposed on the already existing pancreatitis? Does that happen at all? Is, is that uh, uh, in the realm of possibility? And if so, how does one recognize that? Yeah. I think the answer is yes. Yeah. The, the, the question is, is there recurrent acute pancreatitis in the setting of necrotizing pancreatitis, the, the answer in my experience is that's very uncommon. And I think the reason is because a lot of times the pancreatic parenchyma is dead and there's, there's less parenchyma to, to create a problem. But obviously that depends, that it's such a heterogeneous disease. If somebody just has peripancreatic necrosis, it's probably a higher risk for, for recurrent pancreatitis. When these people are, are really, really sick, it's hard to tell what, you know, everybody has abdominal pain. And so it's, and, and many people have persistent low grade elevation of circulating amylase or lipase. So I, I think it's challenging to tell, is there a new problem? It's hard enough to tell if somebody's got an ischemic colon, you know, when they're really sick from acute pancreatitis. And I, I have been unpleasantly surprised operating on some people who have gallbladders that look, that are gangrenous or necrotic or totally socked into the liver. You know, so I, I think it's a, it's a real clinical challenge and I don't have a great answer for you as to what's the secret or is there any trick for recognizing this problem. Beyond the idea that if you're invested in the patient's care and you're following the patient longitudinally, every day or every couple of days, rather than once a week or, one, or once every couple of weeks, I think it's easier to see those changes in the, in the acute phases. Uh, can I ask a question, Rajesh? Yeah, please, sir. Uh, Professor Mishra. Does uh, alcoholic versus gallstone pancreatitis 
make any difference that's one number two i have two scenarios where a young boy with alcoholic pancreatitis has been in hospital for over 5 months now with various collections percutaneous drainages multiple antibiotics tracheostomy lung problems pleural effusion and uh, in between he also had some sort of a cardiac arrest and some uh, query hypoxic damage but that's recovering his gcs is 13 by 15 now uh, so why this prolonged could something uh, different be done in this boy to shorten this period of recovery and another scenario is that there was following ercp papillotomy severe acute pancreatitis fluid collections surgeon went in i think fourth or fifth day did laparoscopic cholecystectomy and after that patient is running temperature and fluid collections persist do you think some this was uh, uh, could have been avoided cholecystectomy so soon in this fluid collections that's what we are discussing sir i think nick would you like to take up the question so the the talk the the i think sir the topic of the talk is the timing of necrosectomy in biliary pancreatitis so i mean if you if the question is that whether cholecystectomy in a patient with alcoholic pancreatitis who has run a severe course would alter the course then probably that is not the talk today however the question of doing early cholecystectomy in patient with ercp induced pancreatitis uh, uh nick can you take up that part sure so the the scenario is post ercp pancreatitis with peripancreatic collections early cholecystectomy is performed and now the patient is febrile and there's concern for sepsis i think in that scenario um a sampling of the peripancreatic fluid either by percutaneous aspiration or endoscopic aspiration would be reasonable to rule out uh collection uh, rule out infection in the peripancreatic collection if percutaneous aspiration is not available locally then treating the patient with a short course of antibiotics empirically as a first step in the step up approach to treat what i would presume to be infected peripancreatic collections would be my my um recommendation for therapy gastroenterologist felt uh, that he would wait for this collection to mature then he would do something temperature started coming down so that is where it is well i congratulate you on having a, a multidisciplinary approach which again is one of my um my my soapbox is that these patients really need to be seen by people with expertise from gastroenterology surgery interventional radiology etc so so congratulations thank you uh before rajesh closes the session i would personally like to thank uh, dr nicholas for joining uh, online from us rajesh please close the session thank you thank you nick thank you professor kapoor for the opportunity and nick it was a great talk and great seeing you after such a long time thank you so much you you guys have assembled a, a terrific congress congratulations to yeah, all I of you all credit to professor kapoor he has done a great job yeah thank you sir